OK, so now we can start talking about different parameters of these different topologies and start to compare different networks. First thing we're going to talk about is routing distance. So I've already been using this term, but this is effectively the number of hops or the number of links that you need to traverse to go from one point in the network to another point in the network. It's not the worst case one. It's not the best case one. It's just for any given two points, it is the distance. The diameter of the network I've already alluded to, but now we'll put a name to it, is the maximum routing distance between any two points in the network. And this is an uh, important concern, because you want to build your networks. You can build some of these long, narrow networks where uh, maybe sort of things in the middle can communicate very well, but the things in the extents are very far away and in very high latency to get to each other. Um, or you can build sort of uh, a network that looks something like this. You have very, four very well connected nodes. And you have this sort of long, long string coming out here. And to go from here to there is the worst case length, maximum routing distance, and that is our diameter. So this takes that into account, these sort of irregular networks. These nodes might be very well connected, but this node is, is quite far away from the rest of them. And you could think about putting extra links in there to make everything closer. The average distance is the, uh, you compute all distances between all two pairwise points in your uh, grid or in your uh, uh, topology. And then you divide it by the number of nodes in the system. That's going to give you your average, or the number of pairs, and that's going to give you your average. <clears throat> by section bandwidth, or what sometimes people call minimum bisection bandwidth is an interesting concept. It is the, by definition, it's, it's minimum. So usually people drop this word. But I wanted to put it up here to tell you guys that you can't take any cut through a network. You have to take the minimal cut through the network. So what I mean by that is, let's take a mm, over this board. Uh, let's make this one bigger. We'll take a four airy two cube. It's using our fancy nomenclature here. The minimum bisection bandwidth is an important uh, uh, description of our network here because that's how much bandwidth there is between half the nodes and the other half the nodes. So if you don't know your communication topology or, or you don't know how the rest of the uh, traffic patterns are going to happen. You can just say, well, I want to maximize the minimum of one half communicating with another half. That's a pretty good approximation of what you want to do. Now, let's look at cuts. Let's count the number of links we cut for bisection bandwidth. Let's say we start here and we take a cut that looks like this. Actually, let's do it for different color chalk. <laughs> Cut, 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 cut. So we want one, two, three links. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, so we want effectively, we want to we segment our network into two halves. So we want to make sure we actually can get half of our network at a time here. One, two, three. That's probably not what we want to do. We probably want a different cut to do that. Let's say we do something that looks like Oh, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, oops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so does that cut us into two halves? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and eight nodes. How many, how many links do we cut? One, two, three, four, five, six links. Is our bisection bandwidth six? Well, that is a valid bisection of the network. It does cut or partition our network into two different halves that are equal in number of nodes. But it's not minimal. Let's look at a, maybe a minimal one here. So minimal one might look something like this. Right down the middle. So this still partitions our network into two halves. Eight nodes here, eight nodes there. Except we've now cut one, two, three, four links. So all I'm trying to get across here is if you want bisection bandwidth, you have to go for the middle bisection bandwidth. And you need to be careful about where you cut. And sometimes it's not readily apparent in more complex networks of where the minimum cut is. So I've used this term so far, and I wanted to define it, the degree of a router. This, is, this comes from graph theory when we talk about this, is the degree of the router is the number of connections to a particular point in the network or a particular uh, node in the network. So we'll talk about that as the degree. So in something like a K or, or a, excuse me, a uh, four airy two cube here, we're going to see that our, we're going to have one, two, three, four, and maybe one from the node itself. So our degree here is uh, four or five, depending on how you count. Um, strictly, if you look at just the whole router, the degree of the node is going to be four. If you look at including coming from sort of like the, the processor connection into that point, then we, we add an extra one. So the degree of the switch is going to be five, but the degree of the node is going to be four. OK, so let's take a look at some of these topology parameters here for a 2D mesh. So here we have a simple 2D mesh. Our diameter. For this mesh, is going to be one hop, two hops, three hops, four hops, five hops, six hops. And if we generalize this, we see that it's actually two square root of n minus two. Well, we subtracted two here because you don't, it doesn't take a hop to get to yourself. If you sort of look, if you do the analysis here, if you, if you look at this, you'd say, well, from a big O notation, this should be square root of n. But we don't have to make sort of the, the last hop and the, the first hop, if you will, to get in and out of the node. So we subtract off 2. If you want to look at a 3 cube or a 3D mesh here, it's going to be something like n k root of n minus n, where n is the number of nodes in our, in our system. Bisection bandwidth, <clears throat> if we look at this, we have a 16 node system. You take the square root of that, that's 4. Our bisection bandwidth is actually two times that because there's links going from left to right and right to left. We have a, a bidirectional network here. So we get 2 square root of n as our bisection bandwidth. And our degree of our router. If we assume that there is an uh, uh, entity that is sitting at these nodes that has to communicate into the router, it's going to be 5. And if you look at just the, uh, just the network itself, it's going to be 1 less than that, or 4. So we talked about this um, a little bit already, but I wanted to just uh, uh, talk a little bit more about it. When you're going to build a big computer with lots and lots of nodes, whether this be wide area network, or whether this be a particular sort of uh, massively parallel machine or on-chip network, the packaging and the physical layout and the physical space you have to fit in really influences your design. So as we said, a star or a totally connected network or a fully uh, connected crossbar is really great. 
but it's really hard to pack into three space. You might be able to pack it, as we said, on the outside of a sphere. Um, unfortunately, at some point, the wiring density may just get too hard in the middle. You won't even be able to, to do that. People have talked about sort of doing things where you pack, let's say, 1,000 nodes on the outside of a sphere, maybe with something like free space optics. We have lasers sort of shooting between all the different points. It's possible. People have sort of talked about this. Um, I don't think anyone's actually implemented one of those for networks yet, but um, it, it's an interesting concept. <clears throat> OK, so now we can start looking at packing our hypercubes into to lower dimensional spaces here. It's probably possible to lay out a n-dimensional cube in n minus 1 spaces. So if we look at here, we have a three-dimensional cube. I drew it on a two-dimensional surface. It's not too bad. If we wanted to actually sort of regularize this, we'd probably try to sort of fold these up and maybe have each, the, some of the links be twice as long as some of the other links. So it's, it's buildable. Now, if we start, to, what gets really hard, though, is if we start to take these higher dimensional systems and try to fold it into two space. Now, why is two space interesting? Well, chips are effectively 2D space. You have to put the transistors in a, a 2D plane, unless we have some sort of 3D uh, process technology. If you're trying to build in three space, for instance, if you're trying to build in a, uh, a supercomputer or something like that, where it actually is in a physically larger space, you might be able to uh, play some tricks. Or this would actually map very well. Our 3D hypercube here would fit very well. 4D, you might be able to fit in three space. But you probably would have a hard time putting a five-dimensional cube in three space. So sort of the rule of thumb is you might be able to go up one extra dimension by increasing your wire lengths, but the wiring complexity gets pretty hard as you start to go even higher than that. Having said that, people have built full hypercubes in three space and had very long wires. So um, a good example of this is the uh, thinking machines or connection machine one the CM1 was actually a hypercube with, I believe, 65,000 nodes. So big machine. Um, they, they actually sort of, it was a little bit more complex design. They, I, if I recall correctly, not all nodes were uh, connected in a, the hypercube. They rough, roughly had each chip, which had a couple of nodes on it that had a uh, 2D mesh on it. And then those chips were connected via hypercube, a real hypercube. But if you went to go look at one of those, if you sort of looked in the back, there's this huge wiring mess. <clears throat> and that could make sense back when they were making that machine. The reason was wires were very fast relative to the transistor speeds. So if the wires are really fast, you can have long wires in your system relative to the transistor speeds. So if you're going multiple chips, it might make sense to actually have a higher dimensional network because then your router decision, uh, the routers, which are slow, relatively slow relative to the wires, um, you can basically have a, a higher dimensional lookup or a higher dimensional switch point there and then uh, have fewer hops. So you have to go through fewer of those routers. So that might be a good trade off. Now, on the flip side, if we start to go look at something like on chip networks, where we're trying to build a multi core, many core chip with lots and lots of cores on one chip. Nowadays, if you start to look at the wires are relatively slow, and the transistors are quite fast. So it starts to make a lot less sense to build these higher dimensional networks. It still might make some sense to go, let's say, in an n-dimensional space, or n minus 1 space, make an n-dimensional network, but you probably don't want to go a whole lot higher than that. 